All right. Uh, good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here again. I, um, I was here just uh, several months ago. Uh, actually, it was last year already. But um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you a, the story and another view, maybe a different, somewhat different view on deep neural networks from the, the one we heard from uh, Mark in the morning, uh, which is also, uh, let's say, more of a computer science type of talk, but it's really uh, very much based on, on the principles of statistical mechanics and uh, information theory. I, I just wonder how much, uh, how many of you are familiar with the basic concepts of information theory, like uh, mutual information? How many of you know the formula for the Gaussian channel capacity? <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to use it, and if you know it, it will save me a lot of time. So I want to start with things which are more or less familiar and get to some new uh, results uh, very soon, very quickly. So as you know, I mean, uh, this, uh, these machines that we heard about in the morning, the deep neural networks or layered uh, uh, linear threshold gates really revolutionize uh, not only artificial intelligence, but... Uh, technology in the world in general, I think it's not an exaggeration that in some, sound, in some sense it's a revolution that really is making a, the dreams of AI that people like me use only really to think of something which will happen in the far future, like you know, continuous speech recognition, object recognition, driving autonomous cars and who knows what, uh, into, into realities which happens in our lifetime. To me, this is a, a, big, uh, a big surprise, actually. And, and what is really nice about those type of machines that they're not only a diversion, I mean, they're inspired by biology in some sense, uh, which is good uh, for people who actually study real brains uh, in some sense, or connection with neuroscience, but they're also uh, large scale in a very profound sense. I mean, the, the, they, uh, they, the, what really makes them work is the fact that they're big, the data is big, the scale of the problem is big, and, and uh, especially the scale of the input. And, and uh, in some sense, it's ideal for, for uh, a way of thinking of statistical physicists, which is something which we, some of us started already in the 80s. And as you know, at that time, I mean, the statistical physics of uh, neural networks was you know, a very marginal field that had absolutely no impact on computer science. And maybe you know, some physicists were excited about it, but it really went nowhere as far as uh, influencing the film. The, the nice thing for, for people like me, I mean, it's 30 years or even more later, uh, these ideas are coming back and they're coming back as, as, as a, in a very core and a very fundamental sense. So we are in this uh, deep learning age or deep learning evolution. And of course, the big mystery is, is why these things which are based on this very simple uh, linear threshold gates uh, really work uh, so beautifully. Now, it's really a big question and one of the biggest technological riddles of our time to really understand what's so special about these particular architectures. So unlike Mark, I'm actually going to focus on what we really call deep learning. I mean, many layers. What is really the secret of the fact that if we train by what we call error backpropagation, let's say classifying an image of a dog, we actually, and, and we give it this very simple one-bit label, is it a dog or not a dog in the image, uh, eventually these huge, uh, large parametric machines manage to capture, uh, and, and very successfully, I mean, uh, more, more or less at the human level performance, um, human performance level uh, essentially uh, uh, do this very well. And the, 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 the point I want to focus on is really what is the role of many layers, more than two or three or four or five? <laughs> what do we actually gain by adding more layers? And uh, I want to focus on one particular view, uh, which uh, is something I've been focusing on for many years, but turned out to be important again. And this is the question of information, mutual information, <laughs> Shannon's mutual information. How does it flow through the network in some sense? And, and the idea is actually very simple. If you look at these, uh, at these neural networks, uh, let's say the input let denoted by x, so this can be the pixels of an image or something like this, usually high dimensional, high entropy variable, if you look over all images of even just dogs. You know. and, and usually there is a, a very simple label which can be just one bit. Is it a dog or is it me in the image or is it one of some finite small 
categories. Of course, this is not the only way neural networks are used today. There, there's a whole bunch of different type of applications like autoencoders and like uh, many other things where the output is also high dimensional. But I'm not going to talk about these things now, although we have some beginning of uh, new results on this as well. Now, what actually happens in the network is that there is, once the weights are fixed, there is a Markov chain, which I denote here by H1, H2, and so on, with those hidden layers. So this is a Markov chain of representation transformations. I mean, so the first one calcul is calculated directly from the input, the second one directly from the previous one, and so on. So this is a Markov chain, and eventually, at the end of this Markov chain, I can calculate a, a proxy or an approximation to the desired label Y, which I call Y hat. So this is really this linearly separable last layer where relatively easily I can generate an approximate good label. And what is interesting about this Markov chain is that something happens with layer, layer to layer to the representation of the, of the data, which takes it from a usually, in general, highly non-linearly separable, though in very high dimension, almost everything is linearly separable eventually, but, but uh, it's hard to separate it, at least, at least with simple uh, linear social functions to the topology of the representation is changing significantly from layer to layer. So things which are close in the Euclidean topology in the original input become very far in the, in the Euclidean topology in the last layer, and last hidden layer, and, and vice versa. I mean, things which are very far apart are getting together. And I'm really interested in the mathematics behind these uh, topology, topological transformations of the data. And that, so, once we see a Markov chain and we think about variables in high dimension, uh, uh, there is a, it's, a very, it's very natural it is for some of us to think about it in terms of mutual information. So how much information, and I'm going to be more precise about it, is actually preserved in a layer about the input, and how much is actually preserved or is there about the output, and we can think both about the desired label y, which is a function of the data only, that's why it's to the left of my input, and also about the actual output of the layer, which is this y hat, uh, and I can think about the mutual information between any one of those edges as one single random variable, and, and, and both the label and the input. And actually, so one of my main claims, which is still highly controversial, mainly because we haven't published everything that we know, but it's, it's still not really clear why it show that these two numbers, the mutual information about the output and the mutual information about the input, really tell us the gist of the story. And uh, in a sense, they're like, like two other parameters that in some sense capture all the complexity of the problem. That's my main claim. And of course, uh, so the, the way I think about it is that there is actually a cascade of filters. I mean, just like, you know, leaky pipes, when I, I throw the information, flow information through the layers, at each layer I'm actually losing some information about the input while enhancing the information about the label. So think about it as a cascade of filters or nonlinear filters or, or, or just, you know, leaky tubes. And uh, the question is really what governs this uh, flow of information through the layers. So just to make sure that we are all on the same page, I'm going to use some mathematical uh, well-known functions, the, the KL divergence within two distributions, which are just the average log likelihood of two distributions. Of course, I usually assume that Q is absolutely continuous with stack to P. I have to say it after the last talk. Uh, but uh, but uh, of course, so, so this is bounded in some sense, the KL divergence. And uh, actually, we assume that all the distributions just for, 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 for analysis simplicity, are bounded away from zero and one. So we are, in, in some sense, in the interior of the simplexes. This makes the analysis simpler. It's not essential for anything. Now, once I define this uh, non-negative, uh, very important function, the cross, the, the cross entropy or the KL divergence, the, the, nat the most natural one when you talk about two variables is the mutual information, which is just the KL divergence between the joint distribution and the product of the marginals, or essentially, it's, you can think about it as a measure of independence, but it's much more than that. Essentially, this function dominates uh, the large scale behavior of many problems, including source coding and channel coding and information theory, and many other things. And actually, I'm going to use it that this mutual information is really counting, in some sense, uh, the number of representations. And uh, what's really important to remember that this is the difference between the entropy or the uncertainty in the variable x and the uncertainty in the variable x given y. So it's some sort, it's the uncertainty measured in bits or 
in, in log uh, binary, uh, in, in log number of binary questions, uh, uh, the uncertainty removed from x when I know y. So it's zero when nothing is removed. So there's no connection between x and y. And it's bounded by the entropy of either x or y. Now, uh, the important thing for, for just to understand my, my line of thinking is, is what's known as data processing inequality, or DPI, which is essentially that when you move along a Markov chain, uh, information can only go down. You don't gain information. This is by the way, not true for entropy. Entropy can increase if I add noise or, or other things to the layers. But this is in general true. You can gain information about x when you move from layer to layer. And in, in my language, you can't gain information about y either because I'm talking about the desired label y. And of course, uh, an immediate consequence of it that a one-to-one -one transformation doesn't reduce information, which is actually a big computational issue because it means that I can actually, let's say, increase my data with through a very hard computational problem and lo don't lose any information. So mutual information will not tell me anything about the computational hardness of things in general. I mean, the fact that two things have the same mutual information doesn't mean that I know how to translate one to the other or, the, or the vice versa. I may not see this mutual information because I have to, to break a very hard uh, code in order to actually find the one-to-one -one transformation. So the fact that mutual information is equal is actually a very weak statement computationally. Now, so when I apply this, uh, this uh, DPI to, to the, the deep neural networks, you, gain you get immediately this uh, formal chain of inequalities. So the information uh, among the layers goes down. And the information about the desired label, again, y, which is to the left of everything here, also goes down. And one is bounded by the entropy of x, and the other one is bounded by the mutual information of x and y. Now, I'm going to look at this at this chain of inequalities, and I call it the information path of the network. <coughs> and I'm going to measure it through the training during the evolution of the weights, which is usually done by something like stochastic gradient descent, some sort of lo local gradient algorithm, which is noisy. But it's, not, it's essential to some of the things I'm going to say. It's not essential in general. I mean, you can do it by, by either, either optimization techniques. Which are, as long as we talk about local optimization, small changes of the weights, uh, uh, most of what I'm going to say is remain correct. Uh, and, and then, of course, one thing to, 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 to keep in mind is that if you think about this linear threshold function just as house threshold, the sine function, for example, just for simplicity, then essentially each layer is inducing some sort of partition of the input into cells. So the first hidden layer is really throwing a lot of uh, uh, essentially random hyperplanes, and this is going to partition a very fine partition of the input. But once I'm moving along the layers, this partition is becoming coarser and coarser in some sense. And, and so it's inducing a, a, a coarser and coarser partition of the data. So it actually makes perfect sense to think how much information is remained in this partition of x. And remember that what induces this, this partition is really the Euclidean topology of the inputs, uh, which is not always obvious. I mean, so there's some sort of underlying geometry underneath the input itself, which can be just, you know, the, it's usually not the humming distance, really the Euclidean topology. Now, uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to study this, uh, this uh, uh, how the, the evolution of these partitions, if you want. And, and the way to think about it when you talk about information theory is to think about an encoder. So each layer encodes the input in some different representation, and a decoder, which is uh, the function from the layer to the label. So each, each layer is characterized by an encoder and a decoder. And once there is an encoder and decoder, which may or may not be stochastic or deterministic, I don't, at this point it's not important, I can talk about the mutual information given the distribution of x of the encoder and the decoder. And I argue, I mean, this is one of my completely informal statements at this point, but I actually argue that this is basically correct, that in the large scale limit where x is very large, only these two numbers, the mutual information of the encoder and the mutual information of the desired label, which I call, which I call the optimal decoder. Remember, this is not, the mutual, not necessarily the mutual information between y, y hat and t. t is, is just like h, the hidden layer. But it's actually the mutual information between t and y, which is the best I could do with this particular representation. Once I give you a partition of the input, what is the best prediction of the label that you can induce from this particular partition? So I argue that in, in some asymptotic sense, which has to be carefully uh, defined, uh, 
uh, and I'm not going to be uh, even as close or careful as the last talk. Uh, this is uh, in some asymptotic sense in the usual asymptotic typicality argument of information theory. Ixt is dominating the co sample complexity of the decoder and Iyt is dominating what we call the generalization error. Which is, so the higher y, Iyt, the more higher information I have about the desired label, the better generalization is. And the, the higher, the lower Ixt, the less samples I need in order to actually calculate this decoder. So now notice that the, the encoder is very simple at the beginning, and the decoder is very complex. And when I move from layer to layer, the encoder becomes more and more complex, and the decoder becomes more and more simple. And eventually, the last decoder is just a linear separation. OK, so, so there is some sort of trade-off between the complexity of these two functions. And uh, so here is the, the picture I, I'm, I can't avoid showing, which is a simulation of these, uh, of these two uh, variables, the information about the label and the information about uh, the input, in a very small toy problem, like physicists like to do. I mean, 12 bits of input, one bit of output. And what you see here is the information. And I measure the information directly with a technique which is controversial to some of you, to just binning the, the number of layers into enough beans to actually estimate information correctly, and then actually take the coarser possible binning without losing information about the output. So I, I, I'm careful about this is actually the minimal information that is required to flow through the layer in order to actually achieve the performance of the, of the, of the, of course, we can estimate information by many other techniques. And of course, when we go to very high pro large problems, we can't do it this way. So we need to use, for example, the Gaussian process hypothesis about the layers or other techniques, which are now very popular. So, and I'm, we are doing it, but I'm not going to talk about it. What is really striking when we first looked at this, so this is a very specific network, but the picture I get is a very general picture. What you see here is a hundred different repetitions of this small neural network with different initial conditions, I mean different initial weights, and different examples, the order of the example, trained on 80% on out of 2 to the 12 possible inputs. And the, the striking picture that when we saw it, we jumped, was that if you actually train those networks, they seem to follow, first of all, they concentrate very nicely, even for this small problem, in the plan, which means all those 100 entirely different layers and, and weights and network uh, seem to be essentially in the same place in this information plan, not only at the end, but throughout the, all, most of the evolution. So you see here, this is the last hidden layer which starts very low in terms of information about the label, where the first hidden layer, which is this blue here, uh, is actually very high because it doesn't, doesn't lose any information to begin with, and it stays there, but the evolution is actually quite striking when you actually look at how they move. They, they get up to more or less this point, where they seem to concentrate along a diagonal line, which really obeys the data processing inequality, of course, so information can only go down. Remember, this is the input layer, and this is the output layer, and many of you have seen this movie. But this happens after about something like 300 epochs of training, which means 300 cycles of the data. But from this point on, we see a slightly different type of evolution, much slower, looks like dominated by diffusion, essentially, which eventually push the last hidden layer essentially to this very interesting point where it has exactly one bit of input information about the label, which is what you hope for, but also essentially just one bit of information about the, output, the input, which means that out of those 12 bits, only one survives. So this is a perfect, what we call in statistic, minimal sufficient statistic. You don't need to remember anything more than one bit eventually. But what is really interesting is that all the other layers also move to the left. And, and the question is, uh, why does it happen? Does it happen in general? What is the meaning of these numbers? Why do they concentrate? There are many, many interesting mathematical questions. And of course, the most interesting for me at this point is what governs the dynamics of this point. Why do they move along these trajectories? And actually, if you look at those trajectories, just average them, because they concentrate so nicely, you really see this, what I call typical behavior of the information plan uh, trajectories. They start, uh, so the last hidden layer starts very low. And then it moves very quickly to this point C, which is essentially, OK, I, I, I gain about half of the information about the label. But I also move a little bit to the left, which means I, I also remember a lot of irrelevant things about the data. And then most of the cycles from 300 to 9 to 10,000, essentially, are spent on this trajectory from C to E, where all the layers essentially 
it doesn't have to be so, but this is what happens in this example, also move to the left. And eventually, the layers lie on a very interesting line, this optimal line at the end, which I argue uh, is, is the ter information theoretic bound, which I can actually calculate analytically if I know the joint distribution of x and y. This is what I call the information bottleneck bound. But what is really interesting that most of the training is done for the compression, at least of the last hidden representation, from moving from C to E, and eventually bringing me to this uh, almost uh, minimal sufficient statistic. So the question is why it ha is happened and what, so there are many interesting questions. I just want to outline, because we, we've been talking about it for some time now. Many of you heard even me speaking about it. So, so the interesting part is so people started to look more carefully on this, uh, what I call the information plan description of neural networks. And what you see, I, this is the same, the same pictures, just the color is now the number of epochs. And you see that again, with enough data, this compression is actually helping you in the sense that it simplifies the representation, all the layers lie on this line. When you reduce the number of inputs, the first phase, I mean, this uh, coming to this uh, green line, which is essentially when you begin to compress the representation, uh, is essentially the same, but with only 5% of the data, the compression phase uh, doesn't help you and you eventually lose information. And I argue that both lines, I mean, the line that you converge to with a lot of data and the line that you converge to with a finite sample are analytically tractable in some cases, at least, that, uh, if you have the joint distribution effect. So for me, as a theoretician, the interesting question is, are there deep learning problems where I can actually analytically solve them in the sense of finding where are those layers going to lie in this particular representation of the information plan? And that's where I want to take you. So there is an issue of the sample complexity, which is more, much more complicated at this point. I mean, why do they decrease with the number of samples the way they decrease? And how is it related to the classical generalization bounds that we have in learning, like pack bounds or like, you know, pack base bounds or when, many other things that some of you may know, which we use in learning theory, which are all worst case in, in some sense, and they're all based, and this is definitely not worst case. This is some sort of typical behavior, and that's why it, it, it deserves the language of information theory or statistical physics. Hello, just for a second, I, I want to move to presenter. Okay. So, uh, so maybe uh, I just want to, to give you the gist of the, the kind of proofs that we're using in order to connect this with with learning theory. So usually, at least half of my audience are computer scientists. And computer scientists are usually familiar with the things like uh, the, the classical generalization bounds, which are things of this, of this style. The generalization error, or the square of it, is bounded by the log of the cardinality of my hypothesis class, which is the class of functions my network can implement, divided by the sum, number of examples, plus something which is confidence, which is completely negligible in the large scale limit. So uh, this is a very nice bound because it's enough to know that dimensionality, for example, the household dimension or the fractal dimension or the, or the VC dimension, all these kind of things which essentially allow me to cover with size epsilon the hypothesis class. That's why I call H epsilon. It's actually an epsilon cover of my hypothesis class. And then I get this very nice type of bounds, D over M, or square root of D over M for the generalization bound, which is really very nice. And that's why people really like it. The problem with it is that it's, it's way too pessimistic and, and, and in some sense it's completely useless when we talk about deep neural networks. It's giving, because that any way, any reasonable way of estimating the dimensionality of these things is going to be of the order of the number of independent parameters. So even with convolution neural networks or things like this, you are still way too high. So something else is happening here. And we actually saw it in, this, in these simulations that it's not the, the ways can vary dramatically, but something else is this mutual information which is really dominating the, the, the generalization performance eventually. And the question is, why is this mutual information is doing this very interesting path along? So, so, so the, 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 the very simple way of thinking about it is, is to think about those partitions that are induced on the input as, as, you know, as cells. Each layer has its own cell partitioning of the input, and if I want to estimate the number of such cells, information theory tells me that the cardinality of x is essentially 2 to the hx, or hx is the log of the cardinality, the typical cardinality, and, and the cardinality of this, each of these partitions is essentially 2 to the hx given t. This is the same idea that Shannon used in his 
channel coding theorems what have a channel and source coding. This is behind very distortion theory, this is behind channel code. This is the basic idea. But here I'm using it in order to estimate the number of functions or the number of labels that I really need to know if I have this coarse partition of the input. And that's uh, very easy to do. So the cardinality of the partition is essentially 2 to the age divided by 2 to the age, 2 to the age x divided by 2 to the age x given t, assuming not necessarily deterministic partition. And, 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 and so the cardinality is just 2 to the i, which is age x minus age x given t. And now I just plug it, or this is where I'm, I'm doing something, I'm cheating a little bit because I'm using this hypothesis class measure which is generated by the data uh, as if it's given. It's of course not given, and that's where the whole, the whole thing is, is flawed in some sense, but the intuition is right. It's two to the i over m, which dominates the decoder complexity. How many examples are really needed in order to learn the decoder? Because that's essentially my, the number of parts there. And that's very nice because it tells you, okay, this i x t, Every bit of compression is like doubling the data. This is actually very, very important. So, so uh, uh, this is a much more profound type of generalization. But of course, IXT struck strongly depend on the statistics of the data. So this is not a distribution independent bound in any way. And of course, it doesn't, it's not really a bound because estimating ITX during the evolution is actually very difficult. But that's giving me some rationale why, why the, the the compression, I mean, this phase where all the layers move to the left is actually very, yeah, can be very useful for generalization. So this is the way I usually say, so generalization error is dominated by the difference in mutual information between my absolute mutual information on Y and the mutual information that, the, that a layer, the, the last or the, the, a certain representation has about Y. This is easy to show, for example, using Pinsky inequality or things like this. but. Uh, the dimension in some sense, that's like something like the VC dimension, is actually going down and is more or less behaving like two to the mutual information that the input, the representation has about the input. So it's actually very useful for generalization to minimize the mutual information. But of course, how much can you do it? So we know something about this problem for many years. So given, given a representation, which here I denote by x hat, so this is the completely formal abstract representation, any map from x to x hat, I can calculate what is the minimal, the minimal information under some constraint on the mutual information that this representation has on the label y. So this is a, a very simple uh, uh, constraint minimization or constraint optimization problem. So find over all possible encoders which obey this Markov chain, or any one of them, subject to some Lagrange multiplier beta, some constraint on the information on Y, what is the best possible encoder I can find? And this, of course, uh, can be solved more or less ex implicitly, analytically, by this type of iteration between the optimal encoder and the optimal decoder. And it defines this uh, black line here, which is this absolute bound. So in this information plan, there is a line beyond which nothing can go. I mean, it is an information theoretic bound. Even an alien of outer space cannot be above this line for this particular data, for this particular joint distribution of X and Y. So the question is, and there are many other details here. One of them is, okay, what happens if you have a small sample? You don't have the joint distribution of X and Y. You have a sample from the joint distribution of X and Y. This is, of course, what we do in, in practice. How much information can you hope to to achieve about the label, the desired label, the generalization error out of your, my sample, given that you actually learn from a sample. And this was answered essentially by, with a paper by Vizohat Shamir and Sivan Sabato in 2008. And suddenly it gives you this uh, interesting red line, which is called completely intuitive, which I, actually I can draw it here. Essentially, it tells you that the empirical mutual information and the true mutual information can be different by essentially the same number you saw before, the square root of 2 to the i over m, plus some logarithmic correction, which I don't mention here. So this is very nice. The more we compress the representation, the better my approximation. Of course, it's obvious, because if I have a very fine partition, I need a lot of labels to actually estimate the, 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 the to actually label each one of those partitions. So once you, you need to coarsen the partition in order to be able to make good predictions. Otherwise, most of those cells will be we have no labels in them. And of course, you also need those labels to be more or less uniform or homogeneous 
respect to that. That's the hard, the hard part. I mean, how do you guarantee that the encoder is good? So uh, essentially, we are talking about two types of losses. One of them is this absolute compression loss. If you want to compress the representation, there is a loss of mutual information which you can't avoid due to the structure of PXY. The other one is this finite sample loss, the difference between the red and the, red and the, and the black which is how much you lose because you have finite samples. Of course, we, make, we can make this argument much more formal, but essentially, it tells you that there is an optimal point in this plan, which is the best generalization error you can achieve with this particular sample size. And when you increase the sample, this red line is going to approach the black line, but have absolutely not uniformly. I mean, at the beginning, they're very close to each other. At the end, they're very far from each other because very fine partitions requires a lot of labor. Okay. So that's the basic intuition behind the theory. I'm not going to get into it because I want to get to some other things. So, okay, so now we more or less understand, for only more or less, that, that uh, compression can be good. It's, uh, notice, by the way, that I'm talking about different types of compression. People talk about sample compression, which is how many bits you need in order to encode the, sample, the whole sample in the weights. So this is, uh, for example, the works of uh, Stefano Suato and others. This is a different notion, and, and there's no question that sample compression is good for generalization. That's easy to show. By the way, it was showed by Nati Srebro and Ohad Shamir and a few others, good, good friend of mine, a long time ago, 2010, following what we showed actually on clustering. But uh, this is a, some, a very different type of compression. It's compression of one input into the representation of this input in the layers. I don't, lo I don't look at the weights at all. I look only at the activity of the units. Now, I, I want to stress two things since I see Andrew Zucks here. I, I, uh, first of all, I don't, uh, we don't change at all in my analysis the training of the networks. I mean, they're trained by classical vanilla flavor backpropagation. Stochastic gradient ascent, I didn't touch it. Everything we did was some sort of a wrapper. I mean, we measured these quantities given the representation. We didn't change it, didn't affect, we don't need the mutual information you know, to do anything to the network. It's only this you know, x-ray that you do to the layers using mutual information. By the way, if it's not mutual information, let's say I'm completely missing and it's not mutual information or anything close to mutual information, call it whatever you want. These two functions behave very interestingly. They obey some sort of a data processing quality and they tell us they give us a, 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 nice, a nice picture, a nice x-ray. You don't have to do an x-ray of the network if you don't want to, but this x-ray is completely independent from the training of the network itself. Mutual information is not used in the training, and it doesn't affect the training. I can bin my, my units any way I want once the network are trained or, or tra partially trained. This is a com completely consistent way of measuring things in the network. So it has nothing to do with changing the paradigm of learning. Actually, I'm using exactly the classical paradigm of training. Now, of course, you can do other things, like adding noise to the input. This will change the paradigm of training. Or, or do other things which will force the mutual information to decrease. I'm actually talking about the minimum mutual information that is required for the label. Of course, you can train network without losing information. There are all those ResNets and RevNets and many, many architecture which are by construction trained to not to lose much information, although they lose information. What I say that in this case you are losing some of the advantages. But SGD is actually forcing you to lose information. And that's why I want, what I want to show you now. So essentially, when you train those networks, you can see that this uh, mean, the information plan, this uh, beginning of compression, which may or may not happen in on the layer, it depends on the architecture to, in a very strong way, very strongly associated with the knee in the training error, which is this uh, lower curve. So you see that the, the network started to move to the left, the layer started to move to the left, exactly at the point where the knee, where the error starts to saturate. But there's a very big, a very fast decay of training error, and then a very slow and actually noisy decay of training error, spawned away from zero, but it's not completely zero because there's still gradients there, and these gradients still do the work. It's very far from the saturation of the gradients or from the collapse of the gradient, all these things. We're still way, way before that. And you see that those compression, compression to the left is completely associated with the fact that the gradients are small, but noisy. 
Okay, and then of course we verify that in, in, in many ways. I just want to again show you this picture which I showed many, many times. Uh, it's it's the, ratio, the single to noise ratio of the gradients, which is, okay, here you see the, the mean gradient and the, and the standard deviation of the gradient in every one of the layers, and that's my Eiffel Tower network, which is very, very specific, but it's actually very nicely demonstrating the effects. Uh, so the, the, this is in log-log scale, so the difference is the, the log signal to noise ratio, and you see that the signal to noise ratio is flipping, essentially at the same point where the, the layers start to compress, the signal to noise moves from plus 20 dB to minus 20 dB, more or less. Two orders of magnitude uh, difference in the signal to noise ratio of the gradient. And of course, the collapse of the gradient, if you insist, happens much later where the, the units actually saturate and, or not saturate or you have some sort of uh, uh, vanishing gradients. This is not the effect at all. The effect starts much earlier where the signal to noise ratio flips. And when the signal to noise ratio flips, uh, uh, all the layers, and of course, the, the, the noise is higher in the lower layers because it's back propagating from, from the, the top. And, and, but, the, and, but the variance is also higher. And the difference between the variance and the, and the mean remains more or less constant, which tells you, OK, I'm saturating the mutual information. Remember the capacity of the Gaussian channel. It's log 1 plus the signal to noise ratio. The signal to noise ratio is fixed, so the information is fixed. So the Gaussian approximation is actually very valid here. And one thing you also see, if you look at the weights themselves, you see that, in, again, in a log-log plot, they grow linearly, like a drift, if you want, up to this point. And then they grow sublinearly, more or less like a square root of t, beyond this point. So they are dominated by diffusion. Now, I really have to hurry up. So uh, I argue that this diffusion is, first of all, we see it in many different problems, with values, with convolutions, in NIPS, in, in, in MNIST, in, in, in CIFAR, and so on. So this is by no way specific to my toy problem. I don't have the time to, to get into it. What I want to talk about is the effect of this joint compression of the layer on the computation time, the time that it takes to converge. And that's something quite striking that we formalized only recently this year. When you add layers to the network, let's say you move from one layer, one hidden layer, two hidden layers, three up to six hidden layers in this case, you see that the time to converge actually decreases in terms of number of updates, number of iterations, decreases with the number of layers. Now, this is surprising. I mean, so first of all, we saw it, we saw it in this picture that here you spend a lot of time in the yellow, which means it uh, takes forever to, to converge. And here everything is blue or purple, which means that after very few 100 uh, iterations, I'm already up there and all the layers essentially saturate. And you see that the yellow is right next to the red, which means that for most of the updates, nothing changed in the information plane, although the weight's still fluctuating and moving. Now, this uh, calls for a theory. And indeed, we have some sort of a theorem, which I call the compression theorem, which tells you that if you actually look between in the initial information within two consecutive layers, eventually, asymptotically, it is bounded by a constant which depends on the number of relevant dimensions, like the dimension of the manifold that uh, Mark mentioned, or the dimension of uh, any other underlying. So the whole assumption here otherwise the whole thing doesn't work, is that there's an underlying low dimension to the problem, which can be folded all over the place. But if there's no underlying low dimension problem, neural networks are not going to learn it. I completely agree with that statement. Now, what we see here is that there is another term which decays uh, with like a power law with the number of updates. And this is essentially how the irrelevant dimension of the problem disappear. This is the compression. Now, again, without getting into too many formal things, I want to give you the gist of the idea of this proof, which we only recently managed to really nail down completely. What happens to the weights between two consecutive layers is that the first part of the training is actually projecting the layer to a, a, some, some sort of a linear projection to low dimension, which is more or less what we call the canonical correlation analysis projection, which essentially project to low dimension without losing information about the label. But this is a low dimensional projection because there's the assumption of a low dimensional manifold underneath. But then there's another term, this delta WK, which essentially grows like a diffusion. So imagine that in this minimum you, you have a Haitian matrix which is highly skewed. So there are many irrelevant dimensions, which means changing the weights in these dimensions doesn't change the error, doesn't affect the label at all. 
So in those dimensions, the noise will simply diffuse. It will be essentially a free diffusion or almost free diffusion. In the preserved dimensions of the relevant manifold, I cannot diffuse because this will change the label immediately. So what happens in this compression phase is that I have diffusion in the irrelevant dimension, and I don't change anything in the relevant low dimension. Most of the dimensions are irrelevant. I mean, out of the million possible weights, most of the changes will not change the, the label at all, or the error at all. So now I can, I can and this is, of course, uh, where I cheat again a little bit. If I assume that this delta W looks like a random Gaussian process, of course it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a quench randomness in general, which means that this is a, a, a fixed, uh, you know, Wigner type of distribution, and I cannot assume that this is just noise. So that, that requires a lot more careful analysis uh, to actually argue this. But if you assume that this behaves like noise, then the next layer is a nonlinear function of a linear function of the previous layer plus something which looks like noise, where the noise is simply this delta W multiplied by the TK, by the previous layer. So this means that I can really treat this diffusion process as if it's acting like a Gaussian independent noise with respect to the relevant dimensions. So I can bound the mutual, this mutual information by the mutual information of the Gaussian multivariate channel, and, and this I can estimate very precisely. And, and eventually, everything depends on how many dimensions are preserved and how many dimensions are not preserved where I allow this diffusion. And this diffusion is reducing the signal-to-noise ratio of the irrelevant dimensions and eventually, eventually gets me to compression. So that's the idea why it's, S SGD is actually compressing. I'm not saying that every algorithm is doing this. But this actually gives us a very interesting prediction that the time to converge depends on if all the layers really compress together and they don't do what Andrew said, that they all go to the right and stay there, but actually help each other, compressing each other, then the time to compress, to, uh, to, to, to get to good realization, depends on how well I divide the irrelevant information between the layers. Let's say that I divide it equally, just for simplicity, then it gives me this very simple power law. Time to converge with k's layers should scale like k to the one, minus one over alpha, negative power, where alpha is the diffusion exponent, which is half if in, in, in flat diffusion in general. This is the prediction which I, I got you know, by uh, uh, basically hand-waving uh, back-of-the-envelope type calculation. And of course, we went and checked it numerically. So this is what you see in the distort problem. The, the number of iteration in, the log, in, in a log-low plot as a function of number of layers goes down with the exact power law, which fits very nicely this assumption of half exponent. A half a diffusion exponent. So okay, that's this is very surprising. Exactly, perfectly nice linear log logs fit. Now we looked at MNIST, this you know practical problem we heard about, and you see exactly the same type of power law with a different exponent. So here it's not so simple. And again, we know that this exponent is related to the change in slope of the growth of the weights. And remember that I'm not doing any regularization here. So the question is how general this is. Of course, it doesn't go forever. If you increase the number of layers more and more, you are not going to gain more and more time. At some point, it's going to bump back. And the reason is that this assumption of equal compression between the layers, that they really help each other, is not true anymore. They start to overlap, and they don't compress independent information. So this gives us, uh, you know, so this power law goes, at some point, it starts to bounce back. And if you actually uh, calculate it, you can see that at some point, there's really an optimal number of layers beyond which just this computational issue is going to fail. And that's essentially this point. So you see it goes down, which this is MNIST, by the way, all the way to about seven uh, or eight uh, hidden layers. And then you're starting to go to pay again, and, and the number the of iteration is going to be much larger because this overlapping, uh, this overlap between the filters is going to be very high. They're not independent filters anymore. OK, so I actually wanted to tell you a lot more about where do these points converge to in terms of criticality, critical points along the information curve? This is my main uh, hot topic at this point. So there is a theory behind the bottleneck which tells us that computation time, the, the layers are not going to be pushed all the way. They're going to get stuck in some places. And these places can be predicted just from the joint distribution by analyzing the, the bottleneck equations. But I'm not going to tell you today, so uh, I'll stop here and uh, allow you for some questions. So this is essentially my main message. Uh, 
only two numbers tell you the whole story, the information plane, and the advantage of, mes of many layers is mostly, or at least also computational, in terms of it actually boosts the number of computation dramatically with the number of layers, and there are many other issues, and uh, I want us to pay your attention to a special issue of entropy on the bottleneck, which we are going to have a deadline by the end of this year, and we already have some very interesting papers there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.